I'm going to suggest we use the same approach to this topic that we've used before. That is, use the index. Uh, luckily we have one in a thousand plateau and uh, most of the discussion is going to be about that book. Uh, you find there are quite a few entries relating to lines of flight in the index and we're referred then to further entries under other concepts such as lines and deterritorialization. So there's going to be quite a lot of work and uh, you remember that what we do is to go back and start to read around the actual quote uh, to look at examples of paragraphs and longer sections uh, where the term line of flight is used. Now because there's so much I'm not going to mention all the examples and I'm going to group them together. I have left room for lots more examples on the transcript. I just couldn't mention them all in a short video. We'd been here for hours. Some of the sections refer to the arts, for example, literature, music and painting, and other sections refer to what might be called politics in the most general sense. We find lines of flight being used to discuss things as diverse as sexual identity on the one hand and the war machine on the other. Those discussions also involve other concepts, as you'll see if you read around the quotes, and one in particular is the concept of becoming. So already it's possible to realize that the term line of flight actually is quite central to a number of arguments in the book. I should also mention that it's deployed in some of the other books as well, sometimes under a slightly different name. And I'll mention a couple of additional texts as well. Uh, one uh, tome to pursue, for example, if you're interested, is Desert Islands. OK, let's begin with quite an early example. This one's on page four of my version of A Thousand Plateau. I'm going to call it ATP. And the quote says this, the book is neither object nor subject. To attribute the book to a subject is to overlook the combination of things in it. In a book, as in all things, there are lines of articulation or segmentarity, strata and territories, but also lines of flight, movements of deterritorialization and destratification. Well, they're actually referring to their own book here, the one we're reading. But they understand other books like this too, as we'll see shortly. We can already start to see something of the characteristics of a line of flight. It's not just a poetic image. You know, you don't just fly off somewhere. It's a genuine concept. You might find the first part of the quote I've just read a bit odd if you see books as somehow the unified personal vision of a single author which just pours out onto the page somehow. This particular book, A Thousand Plateau, is deliberately written in a different way. It's a series of wide-ranging essays or academic papers, they call them plateaus, and they've not tried to impose some unified narrative. Instead, they offer combinations of things, Sometimes the sections are explicitly joined together, articulated. Sometimes they're left as relatively separate segments. Sometimes they're organized in layers or strata, perhaps with a section on general topics followed by specific examples. Sometimes they can be read as standing alone. Well, we have a kind of definition of a line of flight here at work in books. It's a movement of deterritorialization and destratification. That's the point. We want to deterritorialize. We want to question the boundaries and the internal organization of territories and see how they are held together. Now, they mean territories in the broad sense here, not just national territories or geographical territories. And one particular theme of Thousand Plateaus is to cross boundaries separating academic subjects. So in this book, Deleuze and Guattari show us how to follow thoughts across the boundaries of conventional academic territories. For example, they join up politics, linguistics, commentaries on music, literature and Freud, and they even add the strangest plateau of all, which is the rather long one on animal communication. That's the one on the refrain. Well, I'm going to choose some more specific examples here in literature. 
And um, in particular, I'm going to mention an author that Deleuze and Guattari are quite fond of. Uh, so fond of him, in fact, they've already written a book uh, on this person before they got to A Thousand Plateaus. This is Franz Kafka. We're going to look and see how this concept, line of flight, helps us understand the work of Kafka. They cite and quote many other authors as well. Uh, typically of them, they don't tell readers of ATP that they are summarising an earlier work on Kafka, but that's what they're doing. Let's start with the quote mentioned in the index in ATP. Here we are, K. The K function designates the line of flight or deterritorialization, carries away all of the assemblages, but also undergoes all kinds of re-territorializations and redundancies. Redundancies of childhood, village life, love, bureaucracy, etc. That's page 98 in ATP. So this quote comes from the fourth plateau on linguistics, and it concerns the particular way in which Kafka uses language, and in particular how this can resist the social order that is implied in conventional language. That's what the fourth plateau is all about. So we have two major novels written by Kafka, The Trial and The Castle, and they both have a character, just called K, who struggles in each case against massive legal and political bureaucracies, trying to defend himself against them. As we follow the adventures of Kay, we start to realise the massive extent of these political and legal assemblages. Let's take a working definition of an assemblage as a combination of a number of seemingly separate institutions, in this case legal arguments and legal systems, combined with various kinds of power relations and so on, they're separate but they're united and they all function as a whole. As we struggle to understand these assemblages, we can start to criticise them through the eyes of K, that is, we realise their extent, and then we can start to deterritorialize, to undermine the unity of the assemblage, to break them into components and to see how they came to be joined together in the first place. Well, as he does this, our hero, K, meets all kinds of processes that try to peg back this critical insight and get him to rejoin various other territories. This is the process re-territorialization. The system fights back. It oppresses him if necessary, but it also tries to integrate him back into normal, uncritical life. In the novel The Castle, for example, he's tempted to join in the cosy life of the local village or to enjoy love affairs with a number of women and generally to stop being such a dangerous outsider. In The Trial, he's urged to do the accepted thing and take his case to a seemingly independent lawyer, although this will of course incorporate him again straight back into the system. There's a bit more detailed discussion, still in A Thousand Plateaus, which shows how Kafka is able to develop an unconventional language to describe the assemblages. What he does is to split up two aspects that are normally combined in a conventional language, the actual content and also typical ways of expressing that content. Well, Kafka starts his critical activities by working on new forms of expression, including some expressions borrowed from bits of the Czech language and Yiddish. And this is added rather jarringly, stutteringly is the term they use, to the high posh German that was spoken in Prague and which writers were expected to use. This gives him a bit of critical distance, some new purchase on how systems of language, like legal or political systems, are put together. First, they tend to assemble different segments of content and expression, and what these do at their most general is turn on bodies and actions and how to regulate them, how they might be spoken about and transformed. And this just goes on in a quite unexceptional, normal way for native speakers. Secondly, to reinforce these linguistic 
efforts, they attempt to embody them in various territorial sites. Various institutions, for example, uh, the centres of uh, jurisprudence, uh, legal discourse, and so on. However, this is never entirely successful, and there is always a potential for deterritorialization. And what Kafka is able to do is analyse both sets of operations, first dividing them into separate activities, and then seeing how they function together. So he's got a bit of critical purchase. And he actually develops this as a result of some earlier experiments with writing style, first in the form of stories written as an exchange of letters, and then in a number of stories written from the point of view of particular animals. He writes stories about burrowing animals. These experiments have the effect of removing him from the normal definitions of subjectivity and the conventions of writing, and this helps him escape from their constraints. Eventually, he was to develop a completely non-subjective, machinic approach, so Deleuze and Guattari say. Uh, all this is actually very well explained in Bogue's wonderful book on Deleuze and literature. Anyway, Kafka was able to discover and then follow a line of flights from conventional language and literature and from their territories and from political constraint. I've put a few more comments on the transcript if you want them, um, basically from uh, Deleuze and Guattari's book on Kafka. For now, I think the main point is that lines of flight are both political and philosophical, even in fictional writing, or at least in the kind of fictional writing admired by Deleuze and Guattari. They're not just flights of fancy where a writer gets personal inspiration from somewhere and follows it into a fictional world. This is often how we think of writing. They're forms of philosophy. So they require initial analysis, and they also require a definite technique to develop them. We need a thoughtful and critical writing technique in this particular case. We might also suspect, even at this stage, that lines of flight are going to end in philosophy. They're going to go from specific variables and contexts to a philosophical grasp of possibilities. Let's carry on with another example from literature. One of my personal favourites in the whole book, ATP, is Plateau 8 on the novella, although I find it actually isn't quoted or cited very often. It's a discussion of three short stories. In the first example, a novella, by Henry James, it's called The Cage. The idea is to show how one of the characters leads a really predictable life in an office. So her life follows, and I quote, the line of rigid segmentarity on which everything seems calculable and foreseen. So she lives her life uh, with one segment at work, then goes on to enjoy a segment of leisure, other segments uh, carry on through a life leading to an engagement and a wedding and so on. Our lives are generally made like that, Deleuze and Guattari say, and they refer to the great molar aggregates, like the state or institutions which run like that. These lines control our identities, including personal identity, and can provide the basis of our relationships with each other. Overall, this is the and I quote, molar or rigid line of segmentarity. That's page 216. Back to the novella, the arrival of a mysterious couple and the messages they exchange with each other, these are never fully explained, introduces another line for the female character. She gets involved with this mysterious couple in the form of, and I quote, a strange passional complicity a wholly intensive molecular life. So this is what they call, Deleuze and Guattari, and I quote again, the line of molecular or supple segment segmentation. We'll come across this idea of molecular dimensions to lines and lives a bit later. Roughly, it means paying attention to the small, often intense components of life rather than the big picture about molar issues like status, position, or career, or big life events, and so on. In the novella, everything returns to normal. The couple marry, and life goes on. 
advance for the character. Everything has changed, as they put it, 218, and she is able to develop, and I quote, a kind of line of flight, challenging the apparent inevitability of a sequence of segments in her life, and leading to, and again I quote, a kind of absolute deterritorialization. In particular, her language and her thoughts undergo a change. When she was being rigidly segmented, she uttered, and I quote, many words in conversations, questions and answers, end of quote. In the passional molecular phase, it was all about, quote, silences, allusions and hasty innuendos, end of quote. The resulting effect of this permanent disruption of her normal life means that conventional references and unambiguous meanings are now undermined so that, quotes, it is no longer possible for anything to stand for anything else. So she's found a line of flight away from segmented life. Well, two other novellas are discussed in that plateau, one by F. Scott Fitzgerald and one by a French writer, Pierrette Flirtiot. Unfortunately, she remains in French, although the novel by Scott Fitzgerald is available. I won't discuss these in detail. There is a general conclusion, however, that might be of interest. Some lines that regulate our lives are imposed from outside, while others arise by chance or are invented, and these particularly refer to lines of flight. These might be the most difficult of all to maintain, and not all groups or people develop them, and some lose them once they have developed them. They can take the form of a rhizome, so we've got a link back to a concept we've discussed before. They cannot be grasped by a single signifier, Deleuze and Guattari tell us, which means there's no single defining characteristic of a line of flight. They don't mean just running away from the world, but rather they operate, and I quote, in causing runoffs, as when you drill a hole in a pipe. All societies leak. Lines of flight are not just Im imaginary or symbolic, but they require activity. A single group or an individual can display all the lines discussed here, segmented ones and lines of flight, and groups and individuals can create lines of flight for themselves. It's not just a poetic possibility. Again, we're told that, and I quote, lines of flight are realities. They are very dangerous for societies. That's page 226. Or elsewhere, and I quote again, lines of flight are imminent to the social field. That is, they exist as potentials in the social field. That's on the next page, 227. Supple segmentarity can produce micro-formations of power, micro-fascisms. That's a quote. Benefits of a line of flight is that it can lead towards a new acceptance, not, quotes, renunciation or resignation, end of quote, but something aimed at happiness. However, as usual, there is a warning. The line of flight can also be, and I quote, imbued with such singular despair in spite of its message of joy, end of quote, that it can lead to death and demolition because it undermines our normal perceptions of ourselves. And it's common to see how novelists can break down after their artistic exertions. This is what the novella by F. Scott Fitzgerald is about, how he cracked up. It's particularly dangerous when the line of flight leads to an obsession with the personal and with subjectivity alone. The line of flight can turn away from connections with other lines and turn instead to, and I quote, destruction, abolition, pure and simple, passion of abolition, end quote. Suicide. It can lead into a, quote, black hole, close quotes, of subjectivity, where everything seems to have a personal subjective meaning only, where people get obsessed with their own subjectivity to the exclusion of anything else. The result can be depression or paranoia. Now, as an aside, Guattari worked in group therapy with obsessionals and paranoids, 
And one of the techniques he used to try and bridge them out of their subjective black hole is to develop what he calls a transversal line. And what happens here is that you go from one territory sideways into another unrelated one. And this opens up all sorts of possibilities to break you out of your own obsessions with yourself. So, for example, uh, he listens carefully to the patients and if one of them says he's interested in cooking, he encourages the patient to get into the kitchens and try and cook. The transversal line was considered to be so important a concept by Deleuze that he went back and rewrote his work on Marcel Proust and discovered all sorts of transversal lines as a literary technique as well. Uh, what Proust does is to describe a series of closed worlds, the Parisian salons, or my personal favourites, the closed worlds of homosexual activity. But he then develops transversal links between them to join up these isolated components into a novel. For example, the world of hetero and homosex is transversely linked by jealousy. Again, I've left more notes on the transcript if you want to pursue this. Let's turn from literature now and look at politics. And a number of examples are found here too, stressing the political aspects of developing lines of flight. Again, we're going to go for liberty. We're going to try and get out from the constraining and rigid territories of various kinds. These constraining territories can refer to dominant notions of sexuality and subjectivity, as we shall see. Let's take sexuality first. In A Thousand Plateaus, we're told that, and I quote, the girl is defined by relations of movement and rest, speed and slowness, by a combination of atoms and emission of particles, hexiety, she never ceases to roam upon a body without organs. She's an abstract line, or a line of flight. Girls slip in everywhere, between orders, acts, ages, sexes. They produce N molecular sexes on the line of flight in relation to the dualism machines they cross right through. The only way to get outside the dualism is to be between, to pass between. End of quote. That's on page 305. You'll note already a connection with concepts we've discussed in this series, hexiates and bodies without organs. In general, then, keeping a sexual identity involves a struggle against dualisms, against tendencies to stick you back into one category or another, male or female. There is a moment when these can be resisted. Avoiding the constraints of dualism means staying on a line of flight, slipping between conventional identities and binaries, a kind of philosophical transgender path, I suppose. We have to reject the process of control that tries to stick us back into dualisms, follow our thoughts and actions along a more abstract line, cross through the dualist identities on offer. And this will require thinking of ourselves differently not as a conventionally sexed subject with either male or female identities, but instead as a process of becoming, something never fully contained within the large-scale molar bodily definitions. Becoming involves us grasping lots more smaller molecular possibilities that can break free of convention and reconfigure themselves. There are lots more possibilities once you start seeing it that way. N possibilities. Well, following a line of flight as a determined project to break free of fixed dualisms is not going to be easy. And there's going to be a temptation always to settle back into a fixed identity again. However, if we first identify a line of flight away from conventional identities and focus on constant becoming, we can maintain a more liberated status, something between, something in the middle. We have to stay at the molecular level to do this, we've just been told. There's a further clue to what this means in another section in ATP, discussing the relations between the sexes. And this discussion points us towards, and I quote, a multiplicity of molecular combinations.
end of quote, that affect the relations of people, not only to each other, but to animals and plants. And the quote here is, we have, quotes, a thousand tiny sexes, close quotes. That's on page 235. Bourdieu's book, Masculine Domination, 2001, is very useful here, reminding us that there are scores of routine occasions in everyday social life where you encounter objects, events or thoughts that are gendered, where you see sex and gender performed, to use a feminist term. Dualisms are maintained by far more than just kids' toys or Disney films. To take an example, describing shopping or driving a car invites sex and gender categorisation. Even fittings for water pipes are called male and female parts, depending on which bits get inserted into other bits. Even the nouns and adjectives in French are gendered, so using that language reminds you constantly of gender distinctions. These molecular activities do not always add up in the same way, and they can be resisted, but the dualism itself is hard to shake off. Politically, Deleuze and Guattari remind us these micro-political or molecular encounters in what is usually called micropolitics are as important in political constraint as the big macro structures of class, family or society. We've discussed a connection between a line of flight and becoming and that's reintroduced in the work on Kafka. Becoming is an important dynamic state described in its own plateau where more fixed and rigid identities or territories are seen as the result of a stopped or frozen becoming. Becoming has become, pardon me, territorialized. We have to become aware of transitional states and their fluidity and this helps us become more critical of the tangible and solid territories. So we're told that Kafka's experiments with writing as an animal helped him become aware of becoming animal. It drew him towards the molecular experiences he shared with animals and that in turn helped him to break away from fixed notions of the human subject. The discussion of sexuality that surrounds the quote I gave you just now leads to an important aspect of becoming, becoming woman. And becoming woman is recommended as the first stage in breaking out of dualist sexual identity and developing a line of flight. Both men and women are going to benefit from this. Uh, women don't want to be conventional women. Men really sometimes don't want to be conventional men either. You might be able to see why feminists in particular are interested in becoming woman, although they are divided in terms of whether this helps women develop their own ways of life or not. Again, I'm going to leave the details for another day, but I'll put some references for this feminist debate on the transcript if you're interested. Let's talk about human subjects in general. You'll already know that human subjectivity is a political matter, that when we're subjectified, we are constrained. Getting human beings to think of themselves as fully formed, creative and free subjects happens to be an excellent way of controlling them, a very characteristic form of control in modern societies. Now again, this might cause problems for you if you think of the subject and subjectivity as being a wonderful, precious site of creativity and freedom. For Deleuze and Guattari, it's not like that. And again, I have a quote here on page 148 of ATP. Here we go. Subjectification essentially constitutes finite linear proceedings of which one ends before the next one begins. Subjectification imposes on the line of flight a segmentarity that is forever repudiating that line and upon absolute deterritorialization a point of abolition that is forever blocking that deterritorialization or diverting it. The reason for this is simple, they tell us. Forms of expression and regimes of signs are still strata and subjectification is no less a stratum than significance. Well, we've discussed significance in the video on the body without organs. It means the way conventional meanings are expressed in language.
Well, a specific example of the way in which apparent subjective freedom is really constrained is also mentioned in Guattari's book, The Machinic Unconscious. This is his own version of A Thousand Plateaus. We're told there that some people, and I quote, mistake deterritorialization for a process of abstraction and purity, increased creativity, liberated from the limits of everyday refrains and available to all. However, there are constraints. Materials are actually already, and I quote, mass mediated. This is a quote on page 109 of that book. And this should warn us off a common view about creativity, that you don't do anything in particular. You summon up your personal insights, you wait for an inspiration and follow it. If you do, you're likely to unconsciously reproduce the terms and meanings, the cliches of the mass media. To really break free, you need philosophical analysis and technique. Now, I must say, my personal experience confirms that point a little bit. I used to run an experimental media course where we looked at some films and videos that attempted to experiment with narratives or representations in various ways. We looked at people like Goddard or Greenaway, Sally Potter, Kenneth Anger. Then students did a project. They were supposed to discuss an experimental technique and then try it for themselves but some thought that experimenting meant just like hanging out with a camera and recording whatever happened to occur, perhaps adding some interesting visual effects later. Well, they often turned out to be not very creative at all, but rather like music videos. Now, Guattari is not daft, and he knows that we do desire overcoding. We like to re-territorialize, and the whole of everyday life is involved in this. Uh, that rigid segments are reassuring. And the whole molar political system encourages us to channel lines of flight back into subsequent segments. Breaking absolutely with the political system is going to be an unusual and rare option. The political system fights back. It deals with threats and dissidents, sometimes killing them, and sometimes using various safety valves which permit limited dissent. Now, in a particular passage, Deleuze and Guattari talk about the function of scapegoating, for example. Well, carrying on the political theme, there are some interesting discussions on the war machine, which is an organisation that's able to mobilise resources to take on the state. They do this in a number of ways, not only by declaring actual military war. Again, big topic. I've left some additional comments on the transcript if you want them. I'm going to end this video with some implications, just like I did before. I'm going to divide them, not really seriously, into philosophical and political. The two are connected in practice. As a sort of philosophical summing up, the existence of both lines of flight and lines of segmentation Processes of both de- and re-territorialization are at work in politics and subjectivity. And philosophically speaking, they can both be seen as interrelated aspects of an abstract machine. Abstract machines operate at the virtual level. We discuss the virtual level in other videos, in the one on body without organs, for example. You remember that at the virtual level, the body without organs is a series of potentials rather than actual concrete combinations of organs. Political organization has a similar virtual level, this time described as an abstract machine, sometimes as a phylum. We might think of it as offering many possible specific combinations of political forces, only some of which will actually be realized. And when they realize, when they appear in normal reality, they can appear as, and I quote, simultaneous states of the abstract machine. Page 246. So, one of these specific states of the abstract political machine does overcoding and segmentation and organizes things like sexual life into binaries. It renders these as some sort of set of principles or axioms and the specific state apparatus tries to identify itself with these axioms in order to gain legitimacy.
so having defined freedom, liberal democracy pretends or claims to be able to offer it. However, other states of the abstract machine are also working and they offer mutations which deterritorialize, draw lines of flight and install systematic opposition, that's what war machines are, on these lines to undergo a constant struggle with blockages of flow and flight. So in political life as we normally recognize it, we can see a whole realm of properly molecular negotiation, translation and transduction. I've just quoted Deleuze and Guattari. Molar lines are undermined, lines of flight are drawn, but some of them head towards black holes. Connections of flow are replaced by more regular connections. Energies are congealed into fixed practices. And all these negotiations and combats go on at the same time. So we can also detect in here a particular implication for a line of flight, maybe. Perhaps they go from the concrete to the abstract. That's specifically what they do. They head towards philosophizing about the concrete. If we're talking about going from one territory to another, we might have to use the term transversal instead. And there's a bit of debate about this. Let's think of some more practical implications just to round things up. Lines of flight are always there as an abstract possibility. I'm interested in the circumstances in which particular individuals or groups discover them. They're going to require some rather unusual perspectives and resources to do this, it seems, because the whole of social organisation at the molar and molecular level is trying to reduce the possibilities of lines of flight, forbid them, or channel them in a safe direction, or to regain any territory as quickly as possible. Well, just to start you off on this, you remember we began by looking at how particular writers are able to develop lines of flight, and musicians and painters as well, though I haven't really discussed them. It might be simply that these are individual geniuses, although Deleuze and Guattari are a bit shifty here. They say, for example, page 221, it should not be said that the genius is an extraordinary person, nor that everybody has genius. So they're a bit weaselly. Right, it's more likely that they are going to be able to deploy resources belonging to different territories. That's maybe how it starts. We saw, for example, that Kafka had access to different languages, different areas of expertise. Experiences of social change and instability can help, we're told, especially if conventional language struggles to keep up with these changes. So Deleuze and Guattari tell us there can be signifying breaks, as they call them in society, following some new invention, especially if it is going to be one that disrupts the state. Writers and others can also avoid re-territorialization by consistently pursuing whole projects that connect up their individual works. And this is described as developing a plane of consistency. And here, writers like Kafka have been able to learn from their own earlier attempts and to gradually extend their technique. Again, writers and painters and musicians are really doing philosophy here. What they're doing is thinking between producing work of the abstract implications of what they're doing. Politically, it seems important to make sure that individual efforts to develop a line of flight are joined into some collective activity because people are going to need support. There's a bit at the end of the plateau on bodies without organs, I think I mentioned, that says it's important to try to join up individual artistic or philosophical experiments to avoid experimenters becoming isolated and defeated. This applies to philosophers as well. There may be a moment where all their analyses of lines might be made consistent. They might start to realize the general implications. All the abstract machines they have identified can get linked into the whole project, just as we saw with artists. And I think this is what lies behind what is perhaps the most abstract remark about lines of flight? And it's found on page 10. The line of flight marks, 
the reality of a finite number of dimensions that the multiplicity effectively fills, the impossibility of the supplementary dimension, unless the multiplicity is transformed by the line of flight. And this in turn leads to, and I quote again, the possibility and necessity of flattening of the multiplicities on a single plane of consistency.